The one thing I want to say is obviously what I've taken from you, Crispin, obviously Pam, um, Marissa, Jay, all the other people who've been suspended and myself when I was suspended, the, the feelings that that letter invokes in you because of the type of language that they use. I mean, I can feel it now and I feel it when you're talking about, you know, how you felt when, when, you, when you had the letter. And that's, that's exactly what it's intended to do. It's, it's intended to make you feel like a criminal, to grind you down. I think it was Pamela that said it, or Joe, I can't remember where, where it wants you to go, oh yes, it was me, I did, I'm terrible. I'm an awful person, I'll never do it again. You know, and like Joe said, they just want you to sit there, be quiet, don't voice any dissent, you know, doff your cap, do as you're told. And I think there is no human right that entitles you to be a member of a, of a political party but if you are in a political party you are governed by contract the rule book the Labour Party rule book the Labour Party um, codes of conduct they form a contract between the Labour Party and the member and the Labour Party contractually have to treat you with dignity and respect. So let's look at these letters. Let's look at some of the, um, the, the sort of hallmarks of them, if you like. So obviously the first thing, and a couple of people have mentioned, it gives you the seven to 14 days to reply. And that's not a very long time. Um, so if, for example, you're poorly, or uh, you have some other commitments or something of that nature, then you should write to the party and say that you can't comply with that date because, and then obviously um, they'll make a decision as to whether or not they'll extend it. But I think you should respond, because if you don't, they'll, they'll either expel you or, or impose some kind of sanction. So um, let me be clear, if you do not fight, you will not win. That's a fact. If you do fight, you're in with a chance. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, let's look at, at, as I said, at the hallmarks of this um, letter. And I, I've just got one here that from another case that I dealt with. So let's look at the typical content. So the first thing, if you take nothing else away when you are um, replying to these letters, please take this away. Do not self-incriminate. That's the golden rule. So in your response, don't self-incriminate because the, the questions are posed in such a way so as to encourage you to do that. So don't fall for that trap. You should answer only what is asked, offer no additional information, keep it businesslike, keep it factual. If they write to you and they say, dear Crispin, dear Joe, dear Pamela, dear Glynis, well, you're not Glynis, Pamela, Crispin and Joe to them. You are Mrs. Millward. Um, you know, Miss Fit Fitzpatrick or whatever your surname is, get into this business-like mode when they respond to you because it's all, it's all psychological. So it's important not to give additional information because in law, the burden of proof is upon the accuser. That's whether the matter is criminal or civil. In civil law, which this comes under that jurisdiction, jurisdiction, easy for me to say, um, the burden of proof is on the balance of probabilities, which means it is more likely than not that something has happened. But it's up to them to actually prove that something happened. So typically, um, the letter will tell you that you are in breach of rule uh, of chapter two, clause 1.8 of the Labour Party rule book. Oh, they absolutely love that clause. And of course, if you, should care to look at it, the rule encompasses all of the protected characteristics of the Equality Act 2010, such as sex, disability, um, religious belief, gender reassignment, and so on. So, um, but the letter will really tell you specifically which protected characteristic you deem to a breach. Now, there's a very good reason for that, because of course, if you, um, if you discriminate against a person or a group with a protected characteristic, it could actually become a criminal offence. Because the Crown Prosecution Service, for example, if I went out and beat somebody up, not that I ever would, because I'm nice, I'm, I wouldn't do that, but if I did, and while I was beating them up, I, I shouted out a, 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 race, a racial slur, 
I would obviously be charged with grievous bodily harm or actual bodily harm, but the tariff for sentencing would be higher because it would deem it would be deemed to be a hate crime because I shouted out the racial slur whilst I was doing it. So of course, the Labour Party won't say you're an anti-Semite or you're a transphobe or you're a homophobe, because to do that without proof of that would be classed as a hate crime. And of course, they that would be defamation. If you're accused of something which is not true, it's defamation. So this is why they word it in this woolly bully way where they make this implication that it might be this or it might be that, but they never come out and tell you. And of course, the letter, another thing they use, which Marissa has mentioned, it will usually then go on to say that you have engaged in conduct prejudicial or grossly detrimental to the Labour Party. Now, prejudicial, detrimental and grossly, those words have a meaning. So let's look at what they actually mean, shall we? So. Um, prejudicial obviously means to injure or impair something. Detrimental means obviously harmful and grossly means in a very obvious and unacceptable manner done flagrantly or in an extremely excessive way. And what you'll find is they will never ever be able to prove any of that. They won't specify in which way your alleged conduct was prejudicial and to what or whom it was prejudicial. They won't be able to specify how the alleged conduct or, or the prejudicial behavior amounts to gross detriment. Um, they'll fail to provide you with evidence of any gross detriment caused to the Labour Party in that there's no evidence of what obviously unacceptable, flagrant, extremely excessive harm was caused to the Labour Party. They will never be able to prove that. And they've got to if they want to make their accusation against you stick. And, you know, they, they call it a, a charge sheet, don't they? It's like being on the police station, isn't it? You know, they refer to the charges and the evidence and all these terms. They're all designed to invoke the feelings in you that, that you've all spoken about this morning. And one of the things they'll say is, in reference to item one, whatever item one is, do you think? So if I said to you, do you think? What am I doing? I'm asking you for your opinion. Why do they want your opinion? They either have the proof to show what you're alleged of is correct in their eye, or they don't. So if they say, do you think, my sort of response to that is, well, in relation to item one, you've asked me, what do I think? Can I just clarify? Are you asking me for my opinion? Don't make it easy for them. Don't roll over like a lassa apso to have your tummy tickled. If you do not understand the questions, if it's not clear to you, write back and say, sorry, I, I don't understand what you mean. You appear to be asking me for my opinion. What is your reason for doing that? You know, mm -hmm. so if they say, do you think you're in breach of the social media conduct um, or whatever it is because of this particular item that we've given you a screenshot of, what are you supposed to be giving your opinion on? They, they must be specific. Now, very often what happens when these letters go on, please, please don't think that they're going to reply to you in 77 to 14 days because they will not. It'll be months if you're lucky. Um, I'm helping a counsellor at the minute in RCLP. Um, her notice of investigation letter came out to her on the 20th of August 2020. She got it back within the 14 days and she still has not had a response. I suspect that what it is with her is because they accused her impliedly of being a transphobe. I arranged for a trans woman in, in um, the CLP and a gay man in the CLP to write character references for her. So, of course, you know, they're stuffed, aren't they? Because you, if you're accusing somebody of, of that behaviour and then you've got people who would be the recipients of that behaviour doing character references for her, then clearly, you know, it throws everything off kilter as far as they're concerned. So what you'll probably get then is something, um, a letter will come back and they'll say they've investigated and they'll, there'll be all the extracts again from clause 2.1.8 from the, the sort of um, social media code of conduct, etc. And they'll say, we're giving you a reminder of your conduct and we're keeping it on your record for 12 months. So reminder of what exactly because again they won't specify what it is you're supposed to have done specifically 
So if you've got a letter like that, you can write back and say, right, what conduct am I being reminded of specifically? Because if you want me to comply, then obviously I can't modify my behaviour unless you tell me what it is exactly that you want me to do. So don't be frightened to ask questions. And, you know, like I said, I, I've, been, I've helped lots of people over the years. So my knowledge comes from that, you know, from being suspended myself and obviously from assisting people. And this is why my hair is so grey, Crispin, because of some of the stuff I've seen, heard and read. So um, what I would like to do very quickly, Crispin, I think um, I'm very grateful to people who are still in the party because obviously I resigned um, and I... Um, don't get all the stuff that gets sent out. But some of you will recall an NEC member, Anne Black. She she was voted off the NEC for a while and now she's back on. And she posts up the reports from the NEC disputes panel. And she's posted up one recently on the 9th of November, which I think is, is, is quite illuminating. And she says that she has a dossier where, where, where suspended members, members are getting in touch with her. And she talks about um, her dossier containing flimsy grounds for auto exclusion. Um, for instance, a few Facebook likes, delving back into the distant past, delays of eight months or more in following up urgent suspensions with evidence, requiring members to respond within seven or 14 days after which they hear nothing for months, impact on mental and physical health exacerbated by the hurtful tone of the letters, instructions not to tell anyone about the contents except their GP, the Samaritans or the Citizens Advice Bureau on pain of further disciplinary action, as has happened with you, Crispin. Um, and she went on to raise those points and has added some new stuff into these letters now, saying that, um, you know, because a, a main source of comfort for people who've been suspended, you know, and let's be clear, you know, expulsion, auto expulsion and suspension, these should be rarities. They shouldn't be something that's thrown around like confetti, these letters, as they are at the minute. They should be rare occurrences, but they're being used as a tool against, you know, left wing socialist um, members and or, or pro-PAL supporters, that kind of thing. So what she said is she wants the letters changed so that um, other members um, can obviously, you know, know about it. Because obviously, if you can't go to meetings or you have to withdraw from party activities because you're administratively suspended, you can't tell anybody. Mm. Um, and so she's changed the rules on confidentiality. And that's why your second letter that went out, Crispin, had a different um, footnote on it saying that you could, you know, um, speak to other people other than just your GP, the Samaritans, that kind of thing. Um, and right, one of the so, things... Yeah. Sorry. Should I, bring, what, should I bring Duncan in now? Yeah, because, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where the time, thank yeah. you. Thank you. What I was interested in uh, was when you sent me a reply to my case was was um, not to because this is my feeling they ask all these questions one two three four five six seven did you send that email did you do that you know it's all kind of like it is a, a an inquisition sort of uh, setup um, it's almost like if you reply to them you're kind of in those numbers then you're kind of going along with their process you you didn't think that was particularly a good idea or i'm not quite sure how you worded it but that but it was something along the lines of you don't really want to give them that idea that you're honoring their system of of uh of disciplinary their disciplinary system yeah it, it it's not so much not honoring the system it's just that the the way in which those questions are phrased, um, they're essentially uh, self-incriminatory. So, um, you know, anyone who has come to me, I, I've always advised not to answer the questions directly in the way that they're phrased, because essentially they're asking you things like, uh, you know, did you post this? Do you, you know, uh, even the ones where it says, do you have any regrets about what you posted? Well, why would you have a regret unless you were admitting guilt? <laughs> So all of the questions are phrased in such a way that essentially they're asking you to do their work for them. And Glynis is quite right that yeah. you know, the, the burden of proof is on the party to prove the offence to the standard of the balance of probabilities. So there's no advantage to you in 
giving them the information for free that helps them to prove that. I mean, my attitude to it is same as you would in a criminal case. If you've got a criminal case where, um, you know, let's say it's not not the best, <laughs> or the punter's given you, uh, you know, information that basically you, you know he probably did it, but you can still run a defence on the basis of um, putting the prosecution to proof. And that's, you know, that's how you would run a defence. You just basically force the prosecution to prove every single part of the, you know, the part of the um, specific offence that they need to prove. And in this instance, I think with the party, um, I just don't see an advantage to you in you know, giving them information that helps them to make their case. So it'd be better, yeah. if, you know, if they ask you a question about, did you post these um, social media comments or whatever, you can, you know, I mean, you can either not answer it or you can answer it by saying, I posted lots of social media comments. I'm unable to discern whether or not these particular comments were ones that I posted in the past because of the thousands that I've actually posted. So if you are alleging that these these comments um, are in, in some way in breach of the rules, then it's for you to prove that I posted them. Yeah. I, mean, that oh, well, look, I, I think, that, I think that's sort of what... <clears throat> yeah, that was what Clinis was, was saying. You're kind of echoing a bit what Clinis was saying about don't incriminate yourself. I think that's probably the most important thing that that I've heard from from here is just don't um, you know you've got to we've got to be clever about what they're what they're doing and how they want to speed up the process I suppose they want to speed it up so they can just get rid of you quickly if you don't incriminate yourself then that's that's kind of a start to stopping that isn't it um, yeah. is there anything else you, you can add to what well, I'm saying I mean in, which is pretty thorough with, with all of this is it, it's all a bit futile because the process itself is so badly flawed um, because of the way in which, I mean, it's badly flawed in structure, but because of the way that it's being operated, um, it's extremely badly flawed. Uh, and it, it, you know, it is, as Joe commented, uh, you know, people's freedom of association under Article 10 of the European Convention of Human Rights and, uh, oh, sorry, Article 11 and freedom of expression under Article 10 of the European Convention, you know, they're both being trampled all over. Uh, there's, there's clearly not a process that accords to natural justice. I mean, one of the requirements of natural justice is that you be given the information necessary in order to rebut the allegations made against you. But in you know many of the cases, they don't give sufficient information. There's also the, the fact that, as far as I can see, that with some of the cases, they are at, you know the allegations that are being made are so absurd that they really do fall into the realm of irrationality. So you know under the, if you look at the Wednesbury case and particularly look at Evangelou uh, against McNichol and the Court of Appeal there made it clear that, yes, the NEC has a broad discretion, but it doesn't have an unfettered discretion. It still has to accord to certain principles such as genuineness, uh, you know, lack of caprice. And one of the others is that it accords to the Wednesbury rules and therefore um, that would include, you know, Wednesbury irrationality. So I think some of the cases are actually so awful they really do fall into the realms of irrationality. I mean, Wensbury basically says irrationality is defined as not considering something you should have considered or considering something that you shouldn't have considered. But the third leg, which really comes up really in Wensbury, is that the decision is so um, irrational that no sensible authority could have actually made that decision. And that's the realms of what you're into with uh, what the NEC has been doing. I mean, my view, the... Uh, prescriptions uh, the rules don't allow prescription uh, i mean that's that's errant nonsense what was done there yes the rule has been changed now in conference 21 but at the time that it was those bodies were prescribed back previously that rule that clause does not allow for a prescription so that's a nonsense in itself secondly um, under the equality act the uh, philosophical and political belief is actually a protected characteristic so those people like, for instance, socialist appeal, who's, who define themselves around you know, their belief in expression of Marxism, uh, that's actually a protected characteristic. And by excluding them from the Labour Party in that way, the Equality Act has actually been breached under Section 1012. So you know, I, I think bottom line here is um, somebody needs to go to court on this and, and kick the hell out of Southside because it's, it's just got so absolutely ridiculous now.